You've found AskMrWizard.com, where serious learning is fun. This is just one of many episodes from AskMrWizard.com. Please check out our YouTube channel or go directly to our website, www.AskMrWizard.com, to find the rest. Thanks. How to understand the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Suppose two people named Alice and Bob are at opposite ends of a large public computer network and they want to generate a large secret number that both of them can use as an encryption key. Afterward, they plan to use that key to encrypt messages to one another. Suppose that the network is entirely public, meaning that there could be thousands of people listening in to everything they send to one another. Suppose that at least one of those thousands of people is an eavesdropper named Eve that works for a government agency controlled by a corrupt political party. Eve's job is to identify and collect information about people that are likely to vote for the political opposition. If Bob and Alice end up on Eve's list, their livelihoods, or even their lives, could be in danger. This means that Alice and Bob can never allow their secret key to be transmitted across the public network. Somehow, Alice and Bob need to communicate the secret key while making it very difficult for Eve to learn it, even though she can listen in on everything they send to one another. Alice and Bob need some system that will let them easily calculate a shared secret number while making it very difficult for Eve to calculate that same number. As long as it is far easier for Alice and Bob to calculate the secret than it is for Eve, then Alice and Bob can make quick use of that secret for almost as long as it takes Eve to calculate it. For example, let's suppose that Alice and Bob come up with a method that lets them independently calculate the the shared secret in two seconds, while Eve needs ten hours to figure it out. Alice and Bob could exchange quite a bit of data in 9.9 hours, before Eve could begin to figure out what they're talking about. After that, they can use their system again to generate a new shared secret, forcing Eve to repeat her harder calculation to try to learn the new key before they change it again. So how can Alice and Bob make it harder for Eve to calculate their shared secret than it is for them? Well, consider the fact that Eve only hears the information that Alice and Bob send across the network. Alice and Bob don't have to send everything they know. They only need to send enough information to facilitate shared calculation of the secret key. They always have the option to retain some information that they do not send. If Alice and Bob can contrive some kind of clever conversation that relies both on information that they do send to each other and on information that they do not send, then maybe they can have an advantage over Eve in the calculation of the secret that they want to share. And it would be best if Alice and Bob do not need to know anything about each other in advance. Let's examine one way to do that. First, suppose Alice chooses a random eight-digit number that we will call X, and she sends it to Bob. Then, Alice chooses another eight-digit random number that we will call A, but she keeps this number secret. Bob also chooses a different random eight-digit number that we will call B, and he keeps this number secret too. Then Alice gets out her trusty old calculator and multiplies her number A with the first number X, calculating AX. She sends AX to Bob. Then Bob gets out his trusty calculator and multiplies his number B with the first number X, calculating BX. He sends BX to Alice. Now, both Alice and Bob have four numbers. One non-secret number, X, that everybody knows. One secret number that they have never transmitted. One number that they calculated and sent. And another number that they received after their partner calculated it. For example, Alice has these four numbers. One of four, she has X, which is that random number that everybody knows. Two of four, she has A the secret number that only Alice knows. 3 of 4, she has AX, which Alice calculated. She knows exactly how that was done. And 4 of 4, she has BX, which was calculated by Bob. And Bob has these four numbers. 1 of 4, he has X, which is that same random number that everybody knows. 
Two of four, he has B, the secret number that only Bob knows. Three of four, he has BX, which Bob calculated. And four of four, he has AX, which was calculated by Alex. Eve, on the other hand, only received three numbers. She got X, which everybody knows. She got AX, which was calculated by Alex, by Alice. And she got BX, which was calculated by Bob. Notice that Alice knows a little more about AX than Bob or Eve. And Bob knows a little more about BX than Alice or Eve. But with all of this information, Alice and Bob are now in possession of enough information to very easily calculate a shared secret number that they never transmitted across the network using simple multiplication. They can do it by multiplying A times B times X. Alice does this by multiplying BX, which she received from Bob, by her secret number A. Bob does this by multiplying AX, which he received from Alice, by his secret number B. Now, both Alice and Bob know the value of A times B times X. From now on, we will refer to this as ABX, and they can use ABX as their shared secret key. Eve cannot immediately calculate ABX because she doesn't know A or B. You might be thinking, now wait a minute. Eve may not have received A or B, but she certainly has enough information to calculate them. For example, since she knows the value of X and the value of AX, she can calculate A by just dividing AX by X. And since she knows the value of BX, she can calculate B by simply dividing BX by X. Then she can calculate ABX by multiplying those three numbers just like Alice and Bob did. Of course, you are correct. But notice that Alice and Bob have forced Eve to work a little harder than they had to. Eve has to divide, while they only have to multiply. Division is a little harder than multiplication. This gives them an advantage. It's a little harder for Eve to calculate the shared secret number than it is for Alice and Bob. You might be thinking, big deal. It won't take Eve very long at all to perform the division, so Alice and Bob will never have time to use their shared secret key even once before Eve can compromise it. You're right. Alice and Bob need to do something to amplify the tiny little advantage that they have developed. Remember we said they don't need to transmit everything? Well, it turns out they can hold back a little bit of information. Think about that first number AX that Alice calculated. She multiplied two eight-digit numbers together to get it. This means that AX will generally be a 16-digit number. The same is true for the number BX that Bob calculated. He also multiplied two eight-digit numbers to get it. This means that BX will usually be a 16-digit number. But suppose that Alice and Bob agree that they will always send only eight digits. In fact, they agree that all of their math will be limited to just eight digits. And any time any number gets larger than eight digits, the extra or most significant digits will be discarded. We will call this eight-digit math. It's rather like an old-fashioned mechanical adding machine or the old-fashioned odometer on a classic car. When all of the available digits overflow, it starts over at 0000000. 000 000 000 000 000 000 000. In the case of AX, Alice sends only the least significant eight digits of AX, and she just throws the top eight digits away. Bob does the same. He sends only the least significant digits, eight digits of BX, throwing away the extra eight digits. It's as if the old-fashioned odometer in your grandfather's old car had overflowed over and over and over again and again and again so that nobody can read it and know the truth about how many miles it has been driven. Information is lost. But the least significant digits have still been generated according to the precise mechanics of the gears connected to the wheels. It's the same way with math. The math still works. Using this kind of truncated eight-digit overflowing math is still very easy for Alice to multiply the A with BX that Bob sent her, so she can still easily calculate ABX. Using eight-digit math, she gets an eight-digit result, revealing only the least significant eight digits. The big end of the result, containing millions of possible values, is forever lost, 
but those remaining eight digits are precisely calculated according to this rigid overflowing math formula for multiplying and discarding. And it's still very easy for Bob to multiply the eight digits of B with the least significant eight digits of AX that he received from Alice so that he can still easily calculate ABX. Using eight digit math, he also gets the exact same eight digit result because even after all the discarding of the most significant digits, the remaining least significant digits are identical. Alice and Bob can thus each independently calculate the same shared eight-digit secret very quickly without transmitting it across the public network, and they can begin using it immediately as the encrypting key for subsequent messages. However, it is now much harder for Eve she no longer has enough information to determine the original values of A or B easily, since the values for AX and BX that she intercepted are missing the most significant digits. She can't use simple division to reverse this calculation. Think about your own days back in grade school, when your school teacher taught you how to multiply and how to divide. When you learned to multiply, you always started with the smaller or least significant digits working out the small end of the problem first. On the other hand, when you learned to divide, you always started with the big end of the numbers, the most significant digits. That's the way we always have divided. Well, when Alice and Bob decided not to transmit those big digits, Eve can't start dividing. Her problem is rather like looking at a very old odometer in a very old car and trying to guess whether the digits have overflowed or not, and if they have overflowed, trying to guess how many times. There's just no way to know. But unlike an old car's odometer, the extra eight digits that Alice and Bob threw away might each have overflowed as many as a hundred million times. Eve's most reliable and, ob and obvious option is just to take an educated guess at the likely values of A and B, testing each to see if it could have generated the least significant digits of AX or BX. Since we are using 8-bit math, there are 99,999,999 possible values. Unless Eve can gather additional information somewhere, or unless she knows some obscure mathematical trick, she needs to take an average of 50 million guesses before she is likely to find the correct key. Now, Alice and Bob have a tremendous advantage over Eve because they withheld some information. In practice, modern computers use much larger numbers, and instead of just multiplying A times B times X, they use exponentiation. So the result is A to the power of B to the power of X. This makes it far harder for Eve to calculate and try to reverse the process. When used with exponentiation and with very large numbers, this kind of key calculation is known as the Diffie-Hellman Exponential Key Exchange Protocol, named after Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman, the two mathematicians who first published it back in 1976, and it relies on withholding the most significant digits after multiplication, which is easy to do with multiplication but makes division much harder. It is very widely used today and it allows two computers to encrypt messages to one another across a public network so that nobody else can interpret intercepted messages. This works well without any need for prearranged shared secret keys. You found AskMrWizard.com where serious learning is fun. This is just one of many episodes from AskMrWizard.com. Please check out our YouTube channel or go directly to our website, www.askmrwizard.com, to find the rest. Thanks.